good, good. All right, so my talk is called, Why is Bitcoin Anti-Fragile? Um, who here has read the book by Nassib Taleb, Anti-Fragile? Okay, I see like maybe three, ten hands. Okay, who's familiar with the concept of anti-fragility? Okay, not that many more. All right, so let me just describe it real quick. Um, uh, when you call something fragile, it means that it does not like volatility, disorder, or um, you know, any sort of sudden jarring movements or something like that. So a vase, for example, is very fragile, right? Something that is robust is something that doesn't care as much about like, being jarred. So a rock is necessarily not, not, not really fragile. It's robust. It doesn't really change when you sort of hit it against something because it's pretty strong. Something that's anti-fragile is something that gains from disorder. It's something that uh, adds to itself, that, that gets better as you, um, you know, sort of throw at it disordering events. So for example, your muscles are anti-fragile, right? When you work out, when you lift something heavy, your muscle fibers tear but your body puts it back so that it gets bigger and stronger, right? Your muscles are anti-fragile. That's the idea of anti-fragility. Now, the question that I'm going to talk about today is why is Bitcoin anti-fragile? Now, I, for many of you, you just learned the concept of anti-fragility, so you might not be completely familiar with what I'm talking about, but think about it. Whenever there are disordering events, volatility, things that sort of jar Bitcoin, Bitcoin tends to get stronger, doesn't it? Right? That, that, that's, it's not at all obvious why. Because for a long time, people thought that Bitcoin was actually more fragile than it was. And there are two instances that I want to sort of point out as, as part of Bitcoin's anti-fragility that we should really take a look and study. First is the Silk Road, and the second is Bitcoin Cash. So let's, let's take a look at this first. Silk Road, who here was involved in Bitcoin at all around October of 2013? Wow, most of you are new, huh? <laughs> all right, so 2013, uh, October 1st, 2013, Ross Ulbricht uh, was arrested by uh, the DEA uh, for being Dread Pirate Roberts of the Silk Road. Silk Road, if you don't know, was uh, a darknet marketplace for trading drugs. And they were famous because Bitcoin was utilized to do most of the trading. So you could buy, for example, ecstasy or cocaine or, you know, even like Staples coupons that you're not supposed to use or something like that on, on Silk Road back then. Um, and that was thought to be the major use case for Bitcoin at the time. October 1st, Ross Ulbricht was arrested in, uh, outside his apartment in San Francisco. Price at that point was $120. Bitcoin was at $120. Later that day, as news of his arrest came out, Bitcoin dropped all the way to like $85. But then it started on a bull run that we hadn't seen until last year. More or less, 2013 from October 1st to something like December 15th, it went on an incredible bull run where it went from $85, uh, the low for that day, all the way up to $1,100 or you know, $1,050, depending on which exchange you were using. It went on an incredible bull run after this bad news. And the thing was, for a lot of people, when, when they were thinking about Bitcoin back in 2013, they thought it was the place for darknet markets, for Silk Road. But it turned out that it wasn't. That wasn't the main use case. And as people discovered that, Bitcoin went up. The other major uh, sort of disordering event that we had uh, was last year, Bitcoin Cash. The, this was originally supposed to be a contingency plan made by Bitmain in case the user activated soft fork happened. Now, I, I was on the air during all of this, right? Like August 1st, I was, uh, I was on World Crypto Network with Tone and it was going to be like a 30-minute show where we were going to talk about, you know, Bitcoin Cash and how it was going to hard fork and everything else. Um, except I mistimed it and we ended up going not just 30 minutes or even an hour or two hours. We were on the air for eight hours. 
And it wasn't just me and Tone. We had like seven other people. We were being shown on like trading floors in various like uh, New, York, New York firms because they wanted to know what was going to happen with Bitcoin Cash. And the thing about Bitcoin Cash was uh, like right before that, the price of Bitcoin before the hard fork event was $2,700. And a lot of people thought that Bitcoin would be completely ruined by a hard fork because there would be brand confusion. There would be two different communities that the network effect would be, uh, you know, lessened and all, all sorts of other stuff. But what happened afterwards? Well, from August 1st all the way to like around December 15th or so, we had an uh, another really, really strong bear market. We went from $2,700 to something like $20,000 combined Bitcoin and Bitcoin Cash as of around December 15th, which is an incredible bull run, right? Based on some bad news, right? Disordering events, you know, volatility, like stuff that should uh, uh, destroy fragile things ended up helping Bitcoin, making Bitcoin stronger. It, it's almost like Bitcoin was lifting weights and it, it tore some muscle, but then it, it gained it back many fold and it, it got stronger as a result. So, that's sort of the motivating question for us today. Why is Bitcoin anti-fragile? What's going on? What, 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 what are the qualities of Bitcoin that are making this so? And I want to explore sort of three different aspects of it. We have the technological, the economic, and the social. Um, and the, and I, I put it in that order because I, I believe the technical is the easiest to understand. The, uh, the economic is somewhat okay to understand. The social, we really don't understand much at all. Uh, but let, let's take a look at each of those in turn. All right, so let's, let's first look at technical uh, anti-fragility. There is definitely technical anti-fragility in Bitcoin, and we'll, we'll, we'll talk about it. But in order to do that, we need to look at some uh, disordering events, right? Some things that sort of jar the Bitcoin ecosystem. Not just Bitcoin, but any sort of technological ecosystem. And uh, let's, let's look at examples of technological disorder. So first... Protocol level attacks. Uh, almost any technological product will have some flaws, right? Bugs, things that aren't, don't work quite right. Those tend to be sort of more internal. Uh, and, you know, there, there are lots of instances of where that, that's happened. You know, you might, you might have a website with the wrong, you know, uh, thing happening at a particular point. L lots, of, lots of stuff like that. Uh, you have maybe more external things, denial of service attacks. You know that if you run a website, this is one of the big things that can happen to you is a distributed denial of service or DDoS attack. And, and these things happen uh, and uh, the website goes down um, and, you know, depending on how things, uh, you know, the webmasters respond, it can either get stronger or not. There are also new technologies. They tend to be very disruptive, very disordering. And, the, uh, and this happens to technology all the time. And depending on how the current handlers of whatever technology it is, you know, uh, respond, it either gets better or it doesn't. The key thing here is that there are very few guarantees, at, at least for Bitcoin. Now, for lots of other technologies, that's not the case, right? Like, uh, you know, uh, what the government often does when they interfere with, uh, with technology is they just sort of make certain things illegal, right? They'll say, okay, you're not allowed to attack in this particular way and we'll, we'll punish it with a five-year prison sentence or something like that. Uh, or, you know, you're not allowed to do certain things or this particular technology is illegal now or something like that. That sort of thing happens all the time. But in Bitcoin, we don't have any of that, right? We don't have big daddy government protecting us. And that actually turns out to be a very good thing. Because in Bitcoin, we get some gains out of this. We get gains out of all these types of attacks. So let's take a look. So transaction malleability. Uh, if you're not familiar with what that was, this, uh, this was something in Bitcoin uh, back in 2013. Mt. Gox famously uh, told everybody that they were losing money due to transaction malleability. They would send out a transaction to somebody that was withdrawing money, and, uh, and somebody would malleate that transaction, and the malleated transaction ID would get into the block. Mt. Gox would mistakenly believe that they didn't send money to the customer and send it again. They claimed that that was why they were insolvent. Um, didn't turn out to be the case, but despite that, that was kind of like a protocol level bug, right? And that was exploited uh, by people. 
But what, what happened then? Well, since that point, we've completely gotten rid of transaction malleability, not just for that reason, but for a whole host of reasons. And recently, last year, we, we had SegWit come online, and SegWit completely removes all malleability vectors. So that means that all transactions have a fixed transaction ID, which is great, because that strengthened the entire protocol. Uh, we have, uh, you know, our own form of denial of service, and this is transaction spam. This is kind of a controversial topic because we don't really know how much actual transaction uh, volume out there is spam or not. But we can see that, for example, in December, there were all sorts of transactions that were constantly back backlogged, and that caused uh, the fees to be very high. Whereas right now, what are, what are the fees right now? Like one Satoshi per byte? It's really, really low. So there, there's some suspicion that miners in particular, uh, and maybe other people that are sort of enemies of Bitcoin, they were sort of putting in transaction spam. Um, and this has been known for a long time, but as a result of transaction spam, we've gotten better. We've started implementing second layer solutions. This not, this not only sort of solves uh, the very base level stuff, but it gives you like a 10,000 X improvement in transaction throughput as a result. That's what we get when, when you're anti-fragile. Third, altcoins, right? And this is, this is a constant attack vector on Bitcoin, is that there are constantly altcoins that claim to be better at something or other. And if it truly is better, it tends to come back into Bitcoin. SegWit, for example, was not in Bitcoin. It got into Litecoin first. And it sort of proved that it, can, it, it wasn't like unsafe or something like that. There was a lot of FUD around SegWit at the time, just like there's a lot of FUD around uh, Lightning right now. But you know, it, it, it turned out to be okay. And, that, and Bitcoin ended up incorporating it as a result. And that's what makes better software. You prove it out in the real world, and then it, 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 it can be incorporated into Bitcoin as a result of that. Now, having so few guarantees, and not just sort of like legislating away uh, these problems like governments tend to do, you end up with a very careful and wise community, right? And this, is, this characterizes Bitcoin development is in that we don't just put in stuff for the sake of it. We're, we're not that coin that uh, just sort of like puts in a new feature every three months. Instead, we test it and make sure that it, it, it works and that there are no attack vectors and look at all sorts of low probability scenarios on how you can attack this particular feature. And that's a very good thing because you're talking about people's money. We're not talking about a website. You know, you, you, you make a mistake on a website, you get a 404, right? Like error page not found. You make a mistake on Bitcoin, people lose like $10 million. It's very important that you have good security. So you ha your timelines on sort of expectations have to be much longer. You know, uh, 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 an operating system like Windows or Mac, they take like two years to develop, right? That's the level of security that you need to have for something like this with some financial product like, like we have. And you know, anyone that tells you they can get a feature in in six weeks, probably trying to sell you something, just, just as a hint. All right, so we're, we talked about technological anti-fragility, and this is something that I've thought about a lot. And I, I used to think, okay, how can technology be anti-fragile? Because if, if you've read Nassib Taleb's book, Anti-Fragile, one of the things he says is that Anti-fragile things are characterized by the fact that they are alive. There's life in them, right? Uh, so muscles, for example, are anti-fragile because they can react and change in response to environmental factors. Whereas something that's dead or man-made, they can't react, and that's why they're not anti-fragile. So I was like, well, Bitcoin is code, isn't it? How can it be anti-fragile? Where's the organic component? Where's the life in Bitcoin? And then it hit me. It's the developers. It's the developers. That's the organic component. That's who gives Bitcoin the technological anti-fragility, right? That's why Bitcoin improves every time, you know, there's an attack against it. And this isn't just like core developers, right? Like when there's an attack, when there's a malleability vector, they fix all possible malleability vectors instead of just that one, right? When there's a hard fork, they don't just fix for that one single hard fork, they fix for every possible hard fork there is. That 
is why Bitcoin is technologically anti-fragile. Because the developers, not just the core developers, but wallet developers, exchange developers, uh, you know, payment processor developers, all of those people are constantly having to react to attacks against the system. They're sort of like the white blood cells, right? They, they, they can go out and attack it and make sure that they're protected against the next round, which may be even worse. That's why Bitcoin is technologically anti-fragile. All right, so we talked about technological anti-fragility. The next one I want to talk about is economic anti-fragility. And this one is, uh, it, you know, technological is a little bit easier to understand, I think. Economic, we're talking about price and how, how markets respond and things like that. So let's take a look at some economic disordering events. Uh, a typical one is a company going bankrupt. Right? Uh, like back in 2009, uh, GM went bankrupt. That disrupted the car industry, right? And I think Chrysler as well. So I mean, there were, it, it didn't just disrupt them, it, dis it disrupted the entire supply chain, all the people that were, all the companies that were supplying parts. That tends to be very economically disordering. Um, another economic disorder is government bans. Um, often happens with tip, uh, some sort of drug or something like that. The FDA will classify it as a series one drug. And you, 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 have to, you can't like, just get a prescription for it or buy it over the counter or something like that. that that's one, another way in which something uh, can get economically disordered. Another one, uh, just volatility in general, and, and this could be uh, you know, economic volatility, uh, but usually it's related to price. So the price of a particular commodity, right, like uh, you know, RAM or something like that, or uh, you know, soybeans or whatever it is. Any, any, anything can have sort of fluctuations based on uh, just the economics of everything. And that can be very disordering. Uh, it, it can go for, something can go from massively profitable to very unprofitable very quickly as a result. And that happens. Again, very few guarantees in Bitcoin. Uh, but again, if you look at this, there's a lot of instances in which the government sort of tries to put its hand on things. So, for example, with GM and Chrysler, they bailed them out, right? They're like, well, we'll, we'll just give you some more money and uh, make sure you don't collapse. Uh, they might ban things, right, that are competition. Uh, uh, you know, China famously uh, banned short selling because they didn't like the economic volatility of certain stocks, right? Or they'll, they'll put a price floor for something or a price ceiling on something. All sorts of ways in which they try to reduce volatility. And all of those things are completely misguided because they make the system more fragile. But we don't have that in Bitcoin. Instead, what we get are economic gains. Let's see what's happened. So companies collapsing. Uh, and the most famous one that we, uh, that, that we all know of is Mt. Gox. And allow me to be frank here. Mt. Gox deserved to die. They deserved to die. They were a completely poorly run shop. Uh, Mark Carpellis famously wrote the entire code himself in PHP without any code review or tests. He, had, uh, he didn't have any cold wallet. He had a VNC connection to another machine that, he, he, that only he knew the password to where he kept all the money. These are not good security practices, and it's not a surprise at all that he got hacked. And if you, if you do get hacked, well, you shouldn't be in business anymore. And what happened after the Mt. Gox collapse? Well, a lot of other players came in that were a lot more careful, right? Coinbase, Bitstamp. Bitfinex, you know, all, uh, there, all sorts of exchanges all over the world, they came online after Mt. Gox, but they realized they had to step up their game because otherwise they would die. And it's not just exchanges like Mt. Gox. Look at miners, you know, Butterfly Labs, KNC Miner, Cointerra, Spondulis Tech, all of those guys did not know how to make miners well, right? And they're all bankrupt now. And that's a very good thing because weak companies need to die. Because when weak companies die, strong companies take over. And that makes the entire system better. Government and irrelevance. Uh, you guys all know China's banned Bitcoin like 30 times or something. <laughs> and uh, at least in 2013, when they first banned it, the market would react sharply. And then they would ban it again. And then it would react just a little less. And then they would ban it again. And it would react just a little less. And it got to the point where, you know, like earlier, uh, last year, they just banned exchanges altogether and the market was like, meh. 
Let's just keep going up. See, what, what happens with government bans is that they just sort of fade into irrelevance. And that's what, what happened to Bitcoin. Because, you know, China did ban exchanges. But what happened? Well, then people started trading on local Bitcoins. So they banned local Bitcoins. What, what happened? There are now all sorts of WeChat and Telegram groups where you can trade OTC. People will find a way. People will find a way. And they'll just go around the government and they become completely irrelevant. Their bans mean nothing. Uncertainty acclimation. So there is a lot of volatility in Bitcoin. If you've been through as many as I have, I've been through four major Bitcoin crashes. 2011, it went from $30 to one. 2013, it went from 260 to 50. 2013, again, it went from 1,200 down to like 180. And of course, the most recent one went from 19,000 to 5,800, something like that. And that's a good thing. The bubbles are a good thing because they shake out the weak hands. They shake out the people that don't know about the technology, that are just in it to make, make some money, right? I tell people all the time, uh, you know, when they ask me, should I invest in Bitcoin, Jimmy? Should I, should I invest right now? I tell them, well, if you're going to sell in six months after it doubles or halves, then don't bother because <laughs> you, you don't understand anything about the technology. So I, I don't want you to be one of the holders. But if you're going to invest for the long term, and be immune to you know, 10x gains and 90% drops, then, then maybe you're ready, right? If, you, if you're gonna hold for five, 10 years, then it makes total sense. But if you're investing for the short term, then this is not for you. And that's who, that's who shakes out. That's who shakes out, of, uh, out as a result of this volatility. And, a resu and as a result of this, as a result of having few guarantees, as a result of having, uh, you know, no government hand trying to like fix everything, we get a very temperate community. And temperance here, if you're not familiar, is sort of like finding that happy middle place. Because there, there are two, two ways you can go wrong. You could be too lazy or too greedy. The too lazy people never got into Bitcoin in the first place. The too greedy people are you know, investing in some scam ICO or something like that, right? And, and that's driven largely out of envy. But, the, but those people don't contribute anything. They don't actually economically benefit the, the whole. You want to be in the middle. You want to be the, you know, you, you want to have the right amount of motivation, but not be so greedy. And, and you can see this in government, right? Like uh, government bails out both ends. They'll bail out the greed, uh, lazy people. It's called welfare. They'll, they'll often bail out the greedy people. You know, it's called bailouts, right? Like, it, it happens all the time. And uh, some people like to protect one side more than the other or are more envious of one side or the other. And they're called Republicans and Democrats, at least in the United States. But regardless, that's, that's what government does. But when, in the absence of that, what you get is actual virtue. You get temperance. You have a group of people that are motivated to contribute in a meaningful way. And that's what we have in Bitcoin. As a result, uh, you know, we, we get anti economic anti-fragility. So what, how, how is this achieved? And the way this is achieved is through holders, like many of you in this room. You're the one that understand the technology. You're not just investing to make a quick buck without knowing what the hell it is. You're, you, you actually understand what's going on and why, why the technology is important and why it's good for society. And that's why we have economic anti-fragility. All right, we've gone through uh, technological and economic anti-fragility. Now we go into the social anti-fragility. First two are relatively easy to understand, but I would argue that the third one is actually the most important. And this is social anti-fragility. And by that I mean Bitcoin sort of as a social movement. And it is a social movement. Many of you are in this room because it's a social movement, right? Like, we're all gathered together. It's a social experiment. And we're all part of this Bitcoin tribe. Now, let's talk about some of the disordering events in any sort of social movement. First one is uh, FUD, or as we call it in Bitcoin, the tulip attack. FUD stands for fear, uncertainty, and doubt, right? Like, people try to make you doubt the fact that Bitcoin is actually useful. And this happens all the time. It's been happening since like 2009, right? People have been saying, 
you know, Bitcoin is bad and it's like tulips or something. That's why I call it the tulip attack because critics can't seem to criticize Bitcoin without mentioning tulips. And if you don't know about tulips, study like what happened in Holland in like the 15th century. Um, there's also the governance takeover attack. And this happens a lot in social movements. Instead of just discrediting the idea itself, they will often try to take over and sort of lead the parade, right? The, and this famously happened in the United States with the Tea Party movement and Occupy Wall Street, right? They were both sort of like ground swelling movements and then politicians got in front of it and said, I represent this re movement and I, uh, I appoint myself as a leader of this movement. And that happens all the time. That's a way to sort of attack that social movement by taking it over. Scams. A lot of people in social movements tend to be very vulnerable because they're going along with things for the sake of uh, sort of going along with it and not really understanding the underlying truth. And scammers take advantage of that. They, they want to, they, they give all of the right social cues but actually don't have any substance behind them. And this is very prevalent in any social movement. And really, there are no guarantees on this. And, you know, governments do try to do that, um, especially in the Middle East and Arab countries. Uh, they'll, they'll often make regulations about all, all, all sorts of social related, social things. But that's generally not a good idea because once you bottle up that volatility, the mini volatility of social movements, then it explodes and you get something like Arab Spring. Okay, and you don't want that. You don't want sort of a, a, a revolution on your hands. That, that's how, how, how things get really bad. This is sort of like a, a cartoon I really like. This is how a lot of people coming into Bitcoin, uh, the, the faux leaders of Bitcoin tend to view Bitcoin. I just heard about Bitcoin, I'm here to fix it. Right? As if we've never heard any of their arguments before, right? And that's, that's who we're fighting, right? These are the types of people that you have to make sure that you're on guard against. All right, so what are the social gains that we get out of this? Well, first of all, FUD only works if you, ha if you believe in authority. And we've been so conditioned by all of these appeals to authority that, you know, we, we don't pay attention to them anymore. The latest example is Jamie Dimon, but you look at like 99 Bitcoins, there are hundreds of people that have called Bitcoin dead at various prices. I love how they put like the price next to when they said it. And it's like wired June of 2011. Bitcoin was like at $3 and they, they call Bitcoin dead, right? Like, and Bitcoin's not worth anything. Don't they look stupid now? But yeah, we, we get immune to appeals to authority. We, instead, we learn to actually evaluate the technology, right? Evaluate the claims instead of somebody in authority telling us what, what, what's right. Second, we learned that businesses are not in charge. And I'm going to specifically point out that this is in regards to the New York Agreement. Because that was an attempt for a government, that was a governance takeover attack. That was an attempt to lead the parade, if you will. A lot of businesses came out front and said, we represent the Bitcoin community and you should listen to us. And, and usually that works. Because teachers unions in the United States, they say, we represent the kids and uh, you should just give us more money. And that they get it, right? Like that, that, sort of, that sort of attack works. But what was extraordinary about Bitcoin is that that didn't work. The holders fought back. They said, no, you, can't, you don't represent us and we're gonna prove it to you. We're gonna show you that we have a futures market and we're gonna value things uh, like as the market values them. And no businesses, you do not represent us. We represent us. Another one, scammers use social cues. They, um, they use you know, fancy sounding words. They write lots of white papers. They, they, they do everything that someone that's credible would do, but try to trick you into believing their thing. And there's a lot of scammers that have been in Bitcoin and are still in Bitcoin. And what they take advantage of is your ignorance. 
they take advantage of your ignorance. Because if you don't actually evaluate the technology and all of the stuff behind it, you will get eaten alive by scammers. And I, I have no doubt that, there, that many people have, because we've seen it, right? And what's interesting is that, at least in Bitcoin, a lot of these scammers have left. They're no longer there. Back in 2011, 2012, 2013, there were lots of scammers. There were people that were saying, I will get you 8% returns every week on Bitcoin. And, uh, and you know, they would just disappear after, you know, you know, like several rounds of a Ponzi or something like that. Instead, those people have moved on to much more fertile pastures. They're mostly doing ICOs or altcoins or running all their own scammy company. And what this points to is that because we have so few guarantees and because we're a community that is informed, that has to go and learn the technology and what's great about it, we have a meritocracy. That's the natural result of people knowing what the hell's going on instead of relying on social cues. And that's the kind of community we have. It's a meritocratic community. That's awesome. If you do good work, you will rise up. You will get more credit. And if you don't do good work or you turn code and you know, do something else, then the community will rightly condemn you and you will no longer have standing. And that's a very good thing. That gives us social anti-fragility. And what gives us this social anti-fragility? What's the organic component? The organic component is the community. It's the people in this room. It's all of you. We're the ones that enforce this stuff. Emin Gunsire back in 2013 wrote a paper called The Selfish Mining Paper. And, uh, and basically, it's, it gets a little technical, but he argued that 33% of, uh, uh, of mining hash power could completely subvert Bitcoin because it, made te it was technologically feasible, it was economically rational, and he said, I broke Bitcoin. You can't, you can't stop the selfish mining attack. And I've always wondered, okay, what's going on? He's right. If you've read the paper, the techno uh, the, it is technologically feasible, it is economically rational, so why isn't anyone doing it? The answer is this, we have a social community. There's a third dimension here. You can't just run an attack on the Bitcoin network without any consequences. There will be people that will boycott you. There will be a user activated soft fork. There will be people that will DDoS your servers. They, you can't just screw over the community and think you're gonna get away with it. There's an enforcement that the community provides and that's why this is so important. And I would argue that this is more important than even the technological and economic anti-fragility. Because the social norms that we come up with, the morality that we have as a community, that's what's caused good behavior in an adversarial network. And that is an amazing emergent property. An amazing emergent property. So we've talked about the technological, economic, and social anti-fragility. And what is this all talking about? Well, we're talking about there being zero guarantees. Zero guarantees, and that is a wonderful thing. That is a wonderful thing. By letting companies die, by not bailing them out, by letting things happen the way they naturally do, we have a much stronger community. We have people that are more motivated to act virtuously that act wisely, that act prudently, that act temperately, that act on the merits and not just the reputation or social standing. And that's what makes Bitcoin better. That's what makes Bitcoin stronger. So to conclude, why is Bitcoin, what makes Bitcoin anti-fragile? Why is Bitcoin anti-fragile? The answer is you. It's the people in this room. It's the holders, it's the developers, it's the community. You guys are the reason why Bitcoin has anti-fragility. You guys are the reason why it continues to get stronger whenever there's a disordering event. Why it continues to go up in price whenever there's bad news. That's why Bitcoin is anti-fragile. Thank you very much.